CVPR, Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference, arguably the most significant event in computer vision calendar, took place in Vancouver a week ago. And for the first time, I had an opportunity to be there in person. This is something I wanted to do for years, and I can imagine that many of you are in the same boat. That's why I decided it would be a cool idea to record this video, tell you a little bit about the conference itself, very briefly discuss this year's top papers, and I met quite a lot of interesting people. So at the end of the video, you will have an opportunity to overhear our conversation. Ah, and before we start, big thanks to all of you who watch our videos, were on CVPR and decided to say hi. It was awesome to talk with you guys and learn that you find our content useful. That was definitely a motivation boost I needed. CVPR is massive and it's still growing. This time there were 7,000 people in attendance and another 3,000 joined virtually. Here is a slide that was displayed during one of the sessions showing the number of submitted and accepted papers each year. This year alone, over 9,000 papers were submitted and around 2,300 of them got accepted. As you can imagine, that's quite a lot of articles for a three-day conference. That makes the actual event very intense, so you need to do your research in advance and know what and when you want to see. There were almost no presentations on main stage, but in exchange we got six poster sessions. Each of those sessions took around two hours, and during that time, authors of several hundred papers had an opportunity to present their work. Each author gets an assigned stand where they hang their poster, hence the name of the session. You can visit them, listen to them talking about their work, ask them questions and request them to explain parts that you don't understand. Overall, it's so much better than just reading the paper. Every time that you find something a bit more challenging, you get to ask the actual author to explain it to you. Quite awesome. As I said before, the conference itself is three days long. But before it begins, you can spend two days on workshop sessions. This is less crowded and more laid back part of the conference as many of the attendees have not yet arrived. So you have the opportunity to meet people and talk with them without much time pressure. This year, RoboFlow participated in computer vision in the wild workshop and we are part of excellent company. There are plenty of talks during the eight hour session, but two of them definitely stand out for me. Andrew Ng had an opening keynote attended by literally hundreds of people, talking about visual prompting and the overall direction, object detection and instance segmentation will take in coming years. Justin Johnson told us about amazing research that he and his team are carrying on the intersection between text images and 3D objects. RoboFlow presented RF100 dataset, a set of 100 object detection datasets harvested from RoboFlow universe that you can use among other things for benchmarking of zero-shot object detectors like Grounding Dyno. You can find more information about RF100 and computer vision in the wild workshop in the video description. Okay, now let's talk about papers. There is a popular misconception among people that have never been to conference like CVPR that new papers are introduced during the conference. Well, that's not the case. The paper needs to be submitted and accepted before we see it on CVPR, and as a result, very often papers are already several months old. Instead, CVPR gives you a unique opportunity to talk to author of your favorite model or paper. In my case, I managed to speak with authors of Grounding Dino, Sam, and one former, probably three of my favorite models from this year. By the way, you can find links to our videos covering those models in the description below. And finally, you also get to look holistically at the whole field, understand which branches of research are becoming more and less popular. CVPR is not only the conference, but also a paper competition. From the initial 2,359 papers, the award community selected 235 highlights and 12 award candidates. If you are interested, you can find the full list of CVPR papers in the description below. I, on the other hand, will focus on papers that I'm interested the most. Of course, generative AI and diffusion models were all the rage on CVPR, but 
Odyssey, open vocabulary panoptic segmentation with text to image diffusion model took me by surprise, trying to apply diffusion to solve panoptic segmentation, which by the way is a combination of instance and semantic segmentation. In principle, they generate a mask based on your image and text prompt, something that other segmentations model can do, but this time they use diffusion to do that. Another model that is trying to solve panoptic segmentation is one former. Here the goal is unification of instance, semantic and panoptic segmentation in a single model. Sure, the model is quite large and slow, but the accuracy of the mask that you can obtain blows my mind every time I run it. Hands down, one of my favorite models from CVPR and the whole 2023 still have seven state-of-the-art badges from Papers with Code. Now let's talk about nerves or neural radiance fields. I recently fell in love with that family of models. As we don't usually cover nerves in our videos, let me start by giving you a brief overview. Nerves allow you to represent a 3D scene as a fully connected neural network, enabling the generation of photorealistic novel views of those scenes with an angle. In simple terms, based on a small set of images or short video depicting a given object, we can create a new image or video from a different angle than the original shot. There are two papers that caught my attention. Neural dynamic image-based rendering dramatically improves the quality of result, even from long videos, featuring uncontrolled camera paths and complex scene motion, which pretty much means that even with terrible quality of input video that is quite shaky, you can still obtain fairly good results. This paper was also recognized by the award community and won the best paper honorable mention. On the other hand, spin nerve allows us to segment neural field and remove selected objects with just few clicks. This is not direction explored by authors, but I immediately thought of using this model to augment dataset for instance segmentation. We started with generative AI paper, so let's wrap it up with two more. First up, instruct peaks to peaks, a multimodal model for editing images with text instructions. Released six months ago, it was instrumental in bootstrapping generative AI features that are rolled out right now in pretty much any image editor. With just a few clicks, we can change the background or facial expression. And last but not least, Dream Booth. As the author said, it's like photo booth, but once the subject is captured, it can be synthesized wherever dreams take you. We can take few images of our subject and generate new ones, but our subject is in completely different place or doing completely different things. As I said in the intro, there were over 2000 papers on CVPR, so it's quite likely that I left out something worth noting. Feel free to let me know in the comments which models you think should be on the list and make sure to stay until the end and listen to our short interviews with Andrew Ng, Satya Malik, Sebastian Reszka and others. If you would like to see more videos in this format, make sure to let us know, leave a like and a comment. In the meantime, stay tuned for more computer vision content coming to this channel very soon. My name is Peter and I see you next time. Bye. For people who are just entering the field, in general, machine learning, but probably I'm more interested in computer vision. Any advice that, that you would have uh, for those people? Um, I would say always um, also start simple before getting too complicated. There's a lot of value in doing simple applications, coding sometimes even from scratch, and then climbing your way to the more complicated models. That's also what I do in my course, for example, where I start with plain PyTorch before adding more complexity with mixed precision training and multi-GPU training. And the same goes also for model architectures, starting simpler as a baseline and then going from there. Because if you have a complicated model that doesn't perform well, it's often like, huh, is there something wrong with my data? Is there a bug in my code? Or what is going on? And if you have a baseline that doesn't perform well, it is, it's informing you, okay, there's maybe something with the data because the baseline is simpler to read. There might be something wrong there. Education in AI. It is very democratic. Even with OpenCV, we have OpenCV University where you, people can come in, take the courses, and get ready for for this uh, workforce, mm -hmm. right? But uh, I highly recommend that there are so many resources available, right? You don't have to understand everything, right? If you get the gist of a few things, that's mm -hmm. enough, right? Let's say you read a paper, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what are the details of the paper, mm -hmm. but as long as you are able to get uh, a general idea of what the paper does, 
if you are able to go to the GitHub repository and run the code mm -hmm. and get some results, mm -hmm. that's a starting point, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to get everything because there's so much thing going on. People may be overwhelmed that, oh, it's right. so hard, but don't worry about it, right? Get something started, get a small piece of code done, right? I mean, I think taking small steps is always the best thing. Like, Everybody's saying that, small have, steps. <laughs> yeah, if you have a particular interest, uh, taking apart some uh, you know, open, open content online is always good, and then picking a project uh, and getting your hands dirty. Of course, uh, we kind of practice a more practical approach to AI, so um, I think you, know, you can uh, dive into research papers, but you can also just dive into trying to make a, an important contribution to open source code online and um, see if people are enjoying that. Okay. Okay. So you think that kind of like looking for the opportunities in, in open source uh, communities to, to contribute yeah. just a small thing, yeah? Even that if it's just a single PR on a re repository that you're excited about, um, and then you can start following what the community is doing and watch from uh, afar now, just anywhere in the world. So I think it just is being willing to try something that you don't know how to do yet, and then um, being a lifelong learner, you know, you just always have to be looking to learn something new and you can't shy away from something because you don't know how to do it yet. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you'll never learn anything. So, um, yeah, I would say take small steps and take every opportunity you can in the right direction, even if you don't know how to do it today. Um, you can kind of keep going in that direction and, and seeking, seeking new things out to learn. Um, it turns out that when the is undergoing disruption, that's often a fantastic time to join So it turns out, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when deep learning was just taking off, that was a fantastic time to join deep learning because there are so many things to be invented that not yet been invented. And also, it turns out the literature for deep learning, you know, like, it wasn't that much to become knowledgeable at to be at the cutting off. 